This book of Proverbs is full of many divine aphorisms. Other parts of scriptures are like a golden chain. The verses link together by coherence. But this book is like a heap of golden rings. Many precious sentences lie scattered up and down like so many jewels or sparkling diamonds. This text is about matters of life and death. The words are mandatory, for all the counsels in Scripture carry in them the force of command, keep thy heart. Here is God's solemn charge to every man, like a judge's charge given from the bench. They will first explain, then apply. The word keep. The Hebrew word to keep has various significances. Sometimes it means to arm or fence. A stroke to the heart kills, so fence your heart. Sometimes it means to take care of something that is not lost, as someone would take care of a piece of precious metal so that it is not taken away. Sometimes it means to keep in safe custody. So keep your heart, lock it up safely, so that it is forthcoming when God calls for it. The second part, thy heart. Thy heart is taken diversely in scriptures. Sometimes it is taken for a vital part, such as in Judges 19. Sometimes for the soul, such as Deuteronomy 13.3. Sometimes for the mind, such as in Proverbs 10. Sometimes for the conscience as in 1 John 3.20, and sometimes for the will and the affections, as in Psalm 119. We'll take it in its full latitude for the whole soul with all its noble faculties and endowments. The heart is a deposit or charge every man is entrusted with keeping. And with all diligence, the original word is literally translated with all keeping. The Hebrew word signifies to keep with watch and ward. A Christian is to set a continual guard around his heart. Some read the words above all keeping. Nothing requires such strict custody. A Christian's heart must ever be in his eye. For out of it are the issues of life. Since the heart is the fountain of life, If the heart lives, the body lives. And if the heart is touched, death follows. So the soul is a spiritual fountain. Out of it issues either sin or grace. From this springhead flow the streams of either salvation or damnation. In these words there is a duty, keep thy heart, the manner, with all diligence, And the reason for out of it are the issues of life. We look at the doctrine. It must be a Christian's great care to keep his heart with all diligence, with all keeping. We are to keep our eyes as Job set watch there in Job 31.1. I made a covenant with my eyes. We are to keep our lips as David bridled his tongue in Psalm 39. I will keep my mouth as a bridle. But we are especially to look to our hearts. Keep thy heart with all keeping. The heart, like Dinah in the Old Testament, will be gadding abroad, and it seldom returns without being defiled. It was the saying of the heathen writer, I never come home with such good desires as I went out with. Christian, your chief work lies with your heart. Keep thy heart. When danger is near, the serpent keeps his head safe. And to preserve his head will expose his whole body to injury. So a wise Christian should especially keep his heart. He should adventure adventure his skin to keep wound from his heart. To amplify this, I will show that the heart must be kept with all kinds of keeping. Show that it must be kept at all times, and then give reasons that enforce this idea. 
the duty. Keep thy heart. The heart must be kept with all kinds of keeping. Keep your heart as you would a temple. The temple was a hallowed place set apart for God's worship. So the heart is the temple of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians 3.16. This heart temple must be kept pure and holy. No filth may lie here. Sweep the dust out of the temple. Christ whipped the buyers and sellers out of the temple in John 2. The cares of the world will be crowding into the heart. Now you must get a whip made of threatenings of the law and drive these money changers out of the temple of your heart. Do not let, the, let God's temple be turned into an exchange. We also must keep our heart as we would keep a treasure. A man who has, great, has a great treasure of money and jewels will keep it with lock and bolt so that it is not stolen. Christian, you carry a precious treasure with you, even all that you are worth, a heart. The devil and the world would rob you of this jewel. Oh, keep your heart as you would keep your life. If you are robbed, you are ruined. Few know the value of their hearts. A farmer can set a price on corn, but not on pearls. Men do not know the worth of that treasure they carry around with them. Therefore, they prefer other things. Keep your heart like a treasure. Keep your heart as you would keep a garden. Your heart is a garden. We see this in Psalm of Song of Solomon 4.12. Weed the sin out of your heart. Among the flowers of the Spirit, weeds will be growing. Weeds of pride, weeds of malice and covetousness. These grow without setting. Therefore, be weeding your heart daily by prayer, examination, and repentance. Weeds hinder the herbs and flowers from growing. The weeds of corruption hinder the growth of, the growth of grace. Where the weed of unbelief grows, it hinders the flower of faith from growing. Weeds spoil the walkways of our heart. We also need to keep our heart as we would keep a garrison. The heart of a man is a garrison or a royal fortress. It is besieged. The devil shoots his fiery darts of temptation, so keep your heart as a tower or castle. Keep a close sentinel on your heart. We find that in Habakkuk 2.1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon a tower. Discover where Satan labors to make a breach. What grace he shoots at, and there, set a double guard and fortify the spot. I wanted to make reference of something, an illustration a little more recent. And if you're familiar with the town of New Orleans and what happened back when Hurricane Katrina come through there, her, uh, there's a big levee around New Orleans. And as the winds and the rains and the waters of that hurricane pounded upon that levee. There was a weak spot, and that's where that devastation came in. And so we have to be on guard and not let that devastation come into our hearts. So we have to make use of all of our spiritual ammunition. And that ammunition is meditation and prayer. Prayer is a great ordinance. Discharge this cannon and be sure to put the bullet of faith in it. That comes from Matthew 21. Keep your heart as you would keep a prisoner. If the heart is guilty and ready, and is ready now and then to break prison, we need to lay bolts and fetters upon it. A prisoner in jail may promise that he will not stir, but when he sees an opportunity, and if you do not watch him, he will file off his fetters and be gone. So, too, the heart promise, promises that it will keep from such sins. But if you are not careful, it will steal out of vanity. Therefore, 
Keep your heart as a prisoner. Keep your heart as you would keep a, keep watch. The heart will unwind to the earth. Therefore, wind it up every morning and every evening by prayer. The motion of a watch is not constant. Sometimes it goes fast and sometimes slower. So it is with the heart. Sometimes it goes faster in vanity and sometimes it goes slower in duty. Therefore, set the spiritual watch by the sundial of the word. Now we look at the manner with all diligence. The heart must be kept at all times. Keep your heart when you are alone. It was Satan's subtlety to set upon Eve when she was alone and less able to resist. He is like a cunning suitor who woos the daughter when her parents are away from home. The devil breaks through the hedge commonly, know, commonly where it is the weakest. But alas, the reason of innate corruption, how many vain, proud, impure thoughts will steal into your heart when, you, when we are most secluded from the world. We also must keep our heart when, you, when we're in company. A good eye, by looking at a watery eye, many times fall into, falls into watering itself. So often a good heart, by beholding and conversing with a profane one, gathers corruption. If you mingle bright and rusty metal together, the rusty metal will not be made bright, but the bright will become rusty. So an evil companion who is rusted with sin will always rub some of his unholy rust upon a man who is bright with grace. Christian, look to your hearts, even in good company. Those who may, like Abijah, have some good thing in them, yet find that good thing to be very small, like a pearl in a heap of stones or like fillings of gold among dust. There may be much levity of discourse among those who are good, and even if there is no filth or scum, yet froth may boil up. These are the most dangerous because they are the least suspicious. Who would suspect a plague in perfumed linen? The devil once crept into a serpent, and he crept into a dove. But Christ spied his cloven hoof. Get thee behind me, Satan. Matthew 16:23. How watchful then we need to be in company. We're also to keep our heart, especially after good duties. When Christ had been praying and fasting, the devil came in and tempted him. See that in Matthew 4. When we have most enlarged in our services, then Satan will tempt us to pride and security. Many Christians' heart, like bows, stand unbent after shootings. They are apt to grow more remiss, as if duty were a sufficient spell and antidote against temptation. Do we not know that Satan always lies waiting? He is more angry with us after duty. Those prayers which appease God incense Satan. And if we lay down our weapons, he will attack and wound us. After David's victory over the Assyrians, he grew lustful and defiled Bathsheba. After we have gotten a victory over Satan in duty, then let us fear lest our hearts give us the slip. When God had driven Adam out of the garden, he, he placed a flaming sword at the east of it to guard the tree of life. When we have cast out the devil by prayer and fasting, let us set a strong guard about our hearts to keep, keep them so the enemy does not make a re-entry. We also must keep our heart in times of adversity. The devil makes use of all winds to toss the soul and make it suffer shipwreck. Adversity has its temptations. No more ships than souls have been cast away in the storm. In adversity, the devil tempts to atheism and desperation. Job 2. Dost thou still retain integrity? Satan used Job's wife as a ladder by which he would have 
scaled the impregnable tower of Job's faith, does thou still retain thy integrity? Was a cutting kind of speech, as if the devil had said, God has pulled down your hedge. He has smitten you and your children. And you are so senseless to still serve and worship God. What have you gotten by this service? Where are you, your earnings? What have, to, what have you to show but your boils? Throw off religion. Curse God and die. Satan medicines are always poisons. Malachi 3.12 Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances? They have mourned and fasted and almost fasted all, all the way. They had, would fast no longer. When man's estate is low and his spirit is trouble, troubled, then Satan begins to throw his angles, and oftentimes Satan makes use of the poverty to, to put man upon indirect courses. Agur feared for his heart in poverty. In Proverbs 30, 8 and 9, O keep your heart in adversity, beware of taking the forbidden fruit. Also, we must keep our heart in times of prosperity. The fuller the moon is, the more remote it is from the sun. And oftentimes, the more full a man is of the world, the further his heart is from God. Deuteronomy 32, 15 Jezreel waxed fat and kicked. It is hard to abound in prosperity and not abound in sin. A full cup is hardly carried without spilling. The trees are never more in danger of the wind when they blossom. Pride, idleness, and luxury are the three daughters which are bred by plenty. Samson fell asleep in Delilah's lap. Millions in the lap of prosperity have slept the sleep of death. Agur prayed, Give me not riches, Proverbs 30. He knew his heart would be ready to run wild. The world's golden apple bewitches. When God sets a hedge of prosperity around us, we need to set a hedge of caution and circumspection. And we look at the reason. For out of it are the issues of life. The reasons for keeping the heart are these. The heart is a slippery piece. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. In the Hebrew, it is the heart of Jacob above all things, a subplanner. If we are not very cautious and watchful, our hearts will cheat us. There is deceit in coins, in friends, and in books. But the heart has an art of deceiving beyond all these. It is, def it is a desperate imposter, said Augustine. The heart will deceive us about sinful things. The heart will tell us that sin is but small, and being small is venial. The heart will apologize for sin, making bad transactions over golden pretenses. The heart will tell a man that he may keep his sin and yet keep his religion too. Second Kings 17:33, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. The heart will secretly suggest to a man that as long as he goes to church and gives alms, that he may secretly indulge corruption, as if duty gave a man a patent to sin. The heart will even quote the heart will even quote scripture to justify sin. First Corinthians nine, twenty and twenty two, to the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. I am made all things to all men. The heart will bring this text out for sinful compliance. Oh the subtle heart that can find a scripture to damn yourself with. Second, the heart will deceive us about lawful things. The heart will tell us that it is lawful to endeavor to preserve our reputation. A good name is, a precious, is as precious ointment. But under a pretense of preserving our good name, 
The heart is ready to tempt the man to self-seeking and make him do all to get such a name. John 12:43. they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. The heart will tell us it is lawful to take comfort in estate and relations. Deuteronomy 26, 11, but the heart will be ready to overshoot how often the wife and the child are put in God's place. The full stream of the affections runs out to the creature and scarcely, drop, scarcely a drop of love is left for Christ. When we overdo, we undo. Third, the heart will deceive us about religious things, our duties and graces. With regard to our duties, the heart will tell us that it is enough to come to the word and to the sacrament. Though the affections are not all wrought, wrought upon, this, like a salamander which lives in the fire, is never the hotter. Will it be any plea at God's bar to tell the Lord how many sermons you have heard? Surely it will be, will be like bringing Uriah's letter. It will be evidence against you. How subtle the heart is to plot its own death and bring a man to hell by the way of duty. With regard to our graces, the heart is like a flattering mirror that will make the hypocrite look good. The hypocrite's knowledge is no better than ignorance. First John 2 and 4, he has illumination, but not assimilation. He has not been made like Christ. He believes, but his heart is not purified. He pretends to trust, to trust God in greater matters, but dares not trust him in lesser ones. He will trust God with his soul, but not with his estate. We must keep the heart with watch and ward, because it is not only false, but fickle. God complains of Israel that their goodness was as early due. In Hosea 6, 4, the sun rises and the dew vanishes. The heart sometimes seems to be in good frame, but it soon alters. Set water upon a fire and it boils. Set it in the open air and it freezes. Those good affections that boil in the church often freeze in the shop. One day a Christian is quick and lively in prayer, and another day he is like the disciples heavy and sweeping. When the heart has been purified in an ordinance, it does not remain pure, but gathers new soil and draws. The heart is humble one day and proud the next. It is meek one day and passionate the next. It is quick in its motions towards heaven one day, and the next the clock is set back. Since the heart is so full of variation and inconsistency, it is needful to keep the heart with all keeping. Like a violin, the heart will soon be out of order. Therefore, we must often screw up the strings and keep the instrument in tune so that we make melody in our heart to the Lord. In the natural body, the heart lives the fountain of life. If the heart lives, the whole body lives. If the heart is tainted and poisoned, the body dies. So in a practical, in a spiritual sense, if the inner man of the heart is holy, then the thoughts and actions are holy. If the soul is earthly and impure, the actions receive to be a bit tincture. In religion, the heart is all. We judge men by men's hearts, by their actions. God judges men's actions by their hearts. It is the heart that gives us, gives the denomination to a thing. Now, if a heart is the spring which makes our actions good or bad, then the heart is chiefly to be watched over and tended. Keep the spring pure. Keep thy heart with all diligence. We look at the application. This shows the difference between the godly and the wicked. The hypocrite 
looks at the externals. He keeps his actions from blotting. He sets his watch before his lips. But the godly man sets his watch before his heart. His main work lies within the doors. He sees the first rising. He sees the first rising of sin and grieves for them. He labors to set his heart right. The heart is the altar that sanctifies the gift. Salvation and blessedness depend upon keeping the heart. Yet how few mind their hearts. They let the devil get into them. The shepherd keeps his flock. The physician keeps his prescriptions. The lawyer keeps his evidence. The merchant keeps his wares. And the covetous man keeps his gold. But few keep their hearts.